welcome to the XY Advisor podcast to join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Head to xyadvisor.com. podcast is proudly sponsored by Spider ETFs. From ETFs to model portfolios, Spider relentlessly pursues new ways to provide solutions to investors' most complex investment challenges. And for investors who want to align their values to their investment strategies, the Spider S&P ASX200 ESG Fund or E200 can be a sustainable alternative to Australia's flagship benchmark. This material is general information only. Investing involves risks including the risk of principal. Investors should consider the PDS available at SSGA.com before making an investment decision. Products issued by State Street Global Advisors, Australia Services Limited, AFSL number 2 Three eight two seven six eighty and four two double zero three nine one four two two five. G'day, how's it going? What do you know? Striker like Clayton here from XY. Um, speaking with Sean all the way over in the states from SMP, mate. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's always good. Uh, what time is it where you currently are? So I'm on the west coast of the United States. So it's three p.m. there. Ah, easy. See, the, I much prefer the West Coast because when I do interviews with the East Coast, they're happening at like 6 a.m. over here. I'm, oh, my God, it kills my, it kills my whole day. So uh, to have a 9 o'clock, it's 9 a.m. here. Oh, my God, this is like I'm living the dream. But um, we're, we're catching up today um, around the concept of ESG, and we've got a handful of questions that, that we want to sort of hit high level. But... Um, the growth of uh, ESG in terms of demand from advised clients compared to the direct to market, that was a concept that we'd been floating in emails back and forth. Um, do you have any type of insights as to whether the, the DIYs, the, the, those that want to invest their own money, are they more interested are they leading the charge in terms of esg investing or are you finding um that the advisor channel is actually ahead or behind the rest of the market or where what's the comparison at the moment so let's let's do the the monty hall let's make a deal and look behind three different doors um (laughs) done rather than rather than two (laughs) <laughs> uh, the first door we have to look behind is the institutional door. You know, this would be pension funds, asset owners. We, we have to acknowledge that they have been driving ESG for the longest time, for decades, really. Hmm. And I think that started in Europe. You know, if you look at the data, particularly within Scandinavian countries, they have been interested in, in doing well by doing good. And they are the main drivers of ESG in terms of assets to this day. Wow. I mean, first of all, there's just so much wealth there, so much money uh, within pension funds and, and asset owners, um, not unlike, you know, super with, within Australia. You know, when yeah. you aggregate that up, there's a lot of money there. Oh, yeah. So that's door number one. Door number two, the, the DIY, the reason why I think so many people feel that that's driving ESG is millennials. Hmm. You know, when you look at different generations, the, the feeling is that millennials care more and they're going to invest. They're going to, to invest in line with their values. So I think that DIY is driving a lot of interest in ESG and it's driving a lot of new products and a lot of invest, investment choices, whether that's in indexing and ETFs or whether that's in mutual funds. So then that door number three would be wealth, wealth managers. And I do think that, that a lot is being missed by the average advisor right now. So my team focuses on financial advisors across the globe, in Australia, in the UK, in Canada, and in the United States. And I would tell you that when we ask the average advisor about ESG, their response, you know, 80% of the time is going to be, my client hasn't asked for it. Yeah. And it's kind of an interesting answer. Because the, the answer that we would hope for would be, I'm having conversations with my client to find out what they believe in and what they value. But they turn it around and they say, no, my client hasn't asked, so I haven't done that much with it. So I do have to uh, agree with where I think you were going with that initial question that 
you would think that advisors would be driving that. Like we typically see that advisors are driving up to 50% of the ETF AUM in the United States. And I don't think it's that different in Australia. You know, yeah. you've been having tremendous growth within ETPs in Australia. And I would say up to 50% of that is, is driven by advisors. So there are some advisors uh, both here and there that are interested in ESG. But I do think that advisors as a whole, they don't get it. And, and they haven't been driving the growth globally. Um, so we need to change that. We need to educate them and get them to see different reasons why ESG should make sense. So I'd love to talk to you about that. That's super interesting. I had no idea. My wife is from Finland, from that you know Scandinavian area. Um, I had no idea that originally, you know, I guess from from a from a birth point that uh, this ESG investment came from that I guess area of the, of the world, and that it's been the institutional money that's been leading the charge. To me, that's surprising, I guess, at least to my mind, because uh, I would have thought that would be the, the, the least connected to the end, I guess, the values. Uh, because DIY, I can see it, in my mind, it, at least it was DIY that would be number one, advised would be number two, and that the institutional money was only interested in, in earning gains. But to hear that actually the institution is, has been driving it. That to me is a, is a really interesting data point. And also um, the fact that from what I can interpret, what you're saying is it's pretty similar in conversations all over the globe from the advisor point of view. So the advisor is saying, actually, I'm, I'm mostly interested in what my client wants. And my goal isn't to uh, push them in any particular direction, which I fully get. And I fully understand why that, um, why that view is, has occurred. Interestingly here in Australia, we've recently had some change in regulations, which makes it now a requirement, strangely enough, a requirement to be proactive in asking the client about specifically ESG investing. So now I love it. Yeah, now we're in a position where Australian advisors, I'm not sure if it's, if it's the only place in the world where this occurs, but we had a massive ethical overhaul of our, of our profession. Um, and as a part of that, this question was introduced as mandatory and kind of interesting uh, over the course of this ongoing podcast series into ethical investment. Um, one of the things I like to talk to about advisors is, hey, like, how do you actually bring this up? Because you don't want, ever want to be in a position where you're making a client feel uncomfortable because either they haven't considered or they don't want to do, you know, quote unquote, ethical investing. You, you, you never, you would hate to put your client in a position where they feel like they're being judged by answering in a, in a certain way. And so it's kind of yeah. it's been interesting to see now that the question's mandatory, uh, it's been interesting to see how advisors are actually uh, bringing it up and, and scoping that question in. But to hear that uh, it's essentially 80% around the world are saying my clients aren't bringing that conversation up. It doesn't surprise me. I, I think just from, a, from an advisor's point of view, you're always wanting just to find information from your client rather than putting it onto the client. But in this case, it's a, it's a new requirement here in Australia. So uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, uh, it's bringing the conversation out a lot more. Um, now, well, let me go. L l I love to talk about that. Yeah. But let me go back to the initial thing that you talked about. A bit of surprise around institutional clients driving ESG. Mm. A couple things I would remind you of. Think about the, the, the how time affects that kind of client. Like that kind of client is thinking decades, thirty years, forty years. They're thinking about their customers or their constituents and the income that they'll provide to them over that long time horizon. Yeah. So they have been thinking for a long time about, you know, what should we be doing for our end clients? And I think that they have also been focused on how do we do the most good within those types of funds? So, you know, it's, it's been led in Scandinavia. It's been led Canada as well. Um, I just saw an RBC report that came out this week that's showing that over 97% of institutional clients in Canada are using some kind of ESG mandate. 97%. Wow. wow. 
So you have these pockets of best practice where this is being driven and, you know, institutional asset managers will look at other institutional asset managers and see, why are you doing that? And I think that advisors, over time, they look at institutional clients as well. They don't adopt all their practices because yes. they're not managing for the same thing. Yes. Um, but certainly for time horizon, I think advisors should be taking that into account. You know, long, is there long-term value that's being generated by an ESG approach compared to a standard core approach. And getting back to, you know, what you just talked about, having that conversation with clients, I think it could be so open-ended. You know, you, you could be sitting down with your client and you could be asking them, what do you believe in? You know, what are the things that you believe in or what are the values that you would like to see expressed within your portfolio? So you're not leading them to a particular product you're trying to find out what they care about. And then you can suggest to them that if you'd like, you could align your portfolio more closely to your values. Again, you're not selling them. You're trying to find out what they care about. Mm. And I think that there's some evidence that that can lead to growth for your business. So, so let me explain that or unpack that a little bit. There have been some advisory firms in the United States that have followed a form of asking more questions. And one of the things that they do that's interesting is they want both partners to come in. Typically what you would find is one of the two partners in, in a marriage or in a partnership is much more financially interested and savvy than the other. Yes. And that would typically be the partner that the advisor would work with. Yes. So this, these firms have said, don't do that. Bring in both partners. And then talk about what do you care about? What are your values? What are your values towards passing money to future generations? What are your values towards charitable institutions and so on? And what the research from that method, that, that, that approach shows is you're much more likely to get the non-financial partner interested once you start to talk about beliefs and values. And once that happens, you as an advisor find out you weren't managing all the money in that household. Yeah. Like that non-financial spouse was controlling where some of that money would go. And as soon as that non-financial spouse becomes more interested, they'd be, you know, now that you've told me this, I'm interested and I want to move more money to you to manage in this way. So it can yes. be a very business building discussion to be curious about what your clients believe in and what their values are, and then to explain to them, if you would like, I can help you align your portfolio to your beliefs and to your values. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's kind of helped solve a question I'd had in my mind for quite a while, which is what can you do to engage the, the one of the partners if in the event that they're not interested in uh in traditional or we'll call it traditional financial planning but just financial planning in general um and of course it makes sense to to bring in that softer side but then when you're including that softer side i always automatically pushed to the realm of you know plans for life and experiential and emotional sort of outcomes that the clients are looking for and getting into that that larger picture of what financial planning is and is becoming, which is that money decisions are life decisions and life decisions are money decisions and taking on, I guess, a bigger view of the client, not just from a monetary point of view, but also everything that surrounds it. What I hadn't right. thought of is this idea that you could probably blend those two a bit closer. So rather than them being not extremes, but I guess rather than them being uh, on separate separate sides of the ledger, if you want to think about it in those terms. I guess ethical investing does bridge in a lot of ways that gap between emotion and rationality or, or, or financial thinking. And, and that's a really, I guess, interesting play where you're not trying to drive the growth of your business by saying, hey, we are an ethical investment firm what you're saying is, hey, we're willing to have the conversation about all aspects of money, 
even those that might not be relevant to all parties, but certainly become more relevant to other parties. And that's, yeah. that's actually a really interesting growth play. Yeah. So I think the second part of what you said applies to most advisors. They need to think about having those conversations, finding out what their clients really care about and making that happen within the, the framework of the client's goals. But I also think that the first one that you talked about, so this would be an advisory firm that would start to highlight or specialize that they do ethical investing. Yes. And to have that as a specialty, what I've seen, especially in the United States is you will start to attract certain clients that really care about that. Like if that's something that you're doing within your website or social media, you are start to, you're going to start to gather a following. So in effect, you have a niche strategy to attract those types of clients. So I think that that can work too. To, to get to what you, you, know, you were talking about, you know, why does this work as business building? Let's start with where most independent advisors should be, which is fiduciaries. Mm. And I would define a, fidu- a fiduciary as someone who's supposed to do what's best for the client, regardless of how they're paid. That's a simple definition of a fiduciary. Yes. There are a lot of things that advisors can do to make their practice more sticky and, and the assets within their practice more sticky or long lasting if they're above that line of fiduciary. So being a leader, being a good steward and having governance. So leadership, I would define as capacity to inspire and engage others. So we've talked about how that can happen with ethical investing. You're engaging both partners. You're finding out what they care about. And you're proposing to them that if they choose to, you can invest in that way. A passion, stewardship, I would define as passion and discipline to protect long-term interests of others. So there's mounting evidence that by looking at firms from the standpoint of, for example, MSA is the way that Sam does it for our indices, looking at media and stakeholder analysis to try to find controversial companies and avoid them that that is a way of generating long-term value. That in effect, even with a well-designed index, you may have companies that are exhibiting more risk than others within these non-financial but material areas of environmental, social, and governance. And then governance itself, I would define as managing the details of prudent decision-making process. So a a prudent decision-making process would be to have more conversations with your clients about what they care about and what they value and to try to align their portfolio to those, those beliefs that the client has. Uh, again, I, mostly I find advisors are not as curious as they should be. Yes. Um, and that's due to the nature of being an advisor. I think there's a certain element of conservatism that works well in that position. You, you kind of, right. the, 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 the mindset of an advisor is someone of protecting wealth, growing wealth, making good decisions because the outcomes and what the advisor is trying to achieve is so important that, uh, that there is certainly a level of, I guess you would say, predictability in how they choose to deal with clients and anything new and ado- adapt- adoption, sorry, adopting anything uh, new is, I, I think there's so, so used to rules and regulations and, and, and laws and uh, reasons why you know you want to avoid things going wrong that there is a slow there is a slow adoption rate for for advisors I think just in general so this this type of questioning and the, and the curiosity I think is a, a problem but it, it comes from a, a good place I, I probably is the best way that I could consider um, contemplating it um, one of so the, I, I, I yeah. agree with you that, yeah. that that is the way that most advisors look at it. They're conservative. They're focused on wealth preservation. Yeah. And I would, furthermore, I would say that they don't want to be perceived as leading the witness. You know, they don't yeah. want to be perceived that they're trying to sell a certain theme. Yes. And again, I'm not proposing that. What I'm proposing is be more proactive in trying to draw in both partners and have a conversation about what are your beliefs? What are your values? Do we currently have them aligned within the portfolio? Can you see that? Mm. Are you interested in doing more along those, those lines? I mean, it's globally, we're seeing more and more people being interested in doing more, making more of a difference. 
Yes. And I think that that's being driven by what's happened since COVID. You know, COVID is one aspect of it where you'd want to see like how are companies, how are companies handling medical situations and social uh, distancing and working from home? Like what companies are doing better with that? What companies are doing worse? But then there's, you know, in some countries, you know, mine is, is a great example. You have a lot of racial strife. And that's right. another area where people want to see, you know, well, what, as a, what, what as a company are you doing about that in mm-hmm. terms of your governance and your social policies? So I think that, you know, advisors, even the most conservative advisor, now might be a good time to be having that conversation with your clients to find out what do you care about? What do you believe in? Are we expressing that within your portfolios? Yeah. Can I, can I take that in a different direction, though? Yeah, like, of course. So one thing that we talk about, so this, this was about building your business, this idea of having the conversation with your client. Another way that you could think about, is it just a better investment or is it looking at things that you've not been looking at that maybe you should? And I think that one of the most compelling areas to look at is non-financial but material risk. So what do I mean by that? That, that sounds a bit jargony. Let me unpack it. <laughs> um, financial risk would be you could look at the, the, the three financial statements of the firm and you could see the health of that firm. Are they profitable? What are their sales metrics? Every advisor has been trained to one degree or the other to look at a firm and to judge its health based on those financial reports. So that would be a balance sheet, an income statement, a statement of cash flows. Well, most advisors, if you think an advisor has been in the business 20 or 30 years, they were trained based on that concept going back to the 80s and 90s. So we did a bit of research looking at the top five companies within the S&P 500. Like what was the size of their tangible resources versus their intangible? So if you go back to 1985, the top five firms are firms that your clients would have heard of. IBM, ExxonMobil, GE, Schlumberger, and Chevron. They had $1.5 trillion in market cap at that point in time. Tangible assets were $1 trillion. Intangible assets were about half a trillion. So most of what you would care about in 1985 were tangible assets, and financial statements would help you measure that. Fast forward to 2018. Now the five largest companies within the S&P 500 are Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. Again, they're all companies that, that, your, uh, that advisors would have heard of or their clients would have heard of, but now $25 trillion in market cap, Whoa. of which $21 trillion is intangible, only $4 trillion is tangible. So those three financial statements, uh, with the possible exception of some footnotes that most people tend to look over anyway, that's only $4 trillion of $25 trillion in market cap. The intangible factors, that's what ESG sets out to measure. And it's become a much bigger part of the market cap of indices like the S&P ASX 200 or the S&P 500. So you've got to look at it from that standpoint of are the methods that you were taught with measuring the health and the risk of that firm in the same way that you thought that they were. When you were first trained as an advisor, financial statements got you more than 80% of the market cap. Now it's only about 20% of the market cap. Wow. That is a whole different lens I'd never considered. That's a really interesting. So you're, so basically this ESG, if we were to even give it, I guess, a, a, a financial lens, it is almost a framework to begin helping discover where value exists in the future. Or where risk exists. I I agree with you, but you also have to look at it like companies that that have had this tremendous blow up and have sunk into the toilet of financial services quickly. In many cases, you know, what would be reported is, oh, yeah, there was something in a footnote, but nobody ever read the footnote like that risk was kind of known. Right. uh, But but people didn't pay that much attention. Now, you know, when you look at the way that, that ESG is done, so Sam, we acquired Sam and, and they've been doing these corporate sustainability analyses for over 20 years. They're asking hundreds of questions and it's industry specific. So you're getting much more depth and insight 
you know, look at it as, you know, sunlight is the, is the greatest disinfectant. Yes. And the more information that, that you can gather about a company and how it manages its risk and its challenges, the better off you are. So let me just make that plea to more advisors like ESG. If you just want to think about it from that perspective, it's helping you gather more information about firms and help you see how they manage risk. And that obviously that's on the G part of the ESG, the governance side, right? Social, I think social and environmental as well. And environmental will be more important for, you know, miners, for example, or, or companies that are drawing resources from the earth. Yes. You know, what, what they do in terms of waste management, um, how effective they are in terms of their use of energy. So industry specific is key. And that's right. the way that we look at it. We have different questions uh, for different industries. And then there's a common set of questions that get asked of every firm. But you, even in the way that you judge a company, like the way that the S&P ASX 200 ESG works, for the most part, it looks on an industry specific lens and says, we want to take the 75% of the companies that have the highest score from a market cap perspective. So when you think about that scoring, doesn't it make sense that you should do it apples to apples? You don't want to compare a miner to a bank because the risks that a bank in, is facing are much different than yeah. a miner would be facing. So you want specific questions and a specific lens and to have those companies be rated on an industry peer comparison. One of the questions that has sprung up in my mind since having so many ESG conversations is a part of each country in their legislation in, in one way or another, there's the pretty much universal idea that a, a board and a, you know, C-suite has to always make the best decision for the shareholders. And that's been the backbone of our capitalistic, um, I guess you could say society for well, certainly as far as I've looked back. Um, Mil Milton Friedman did a lot to, uh, to bring that about in the Chicago School of uh, Economists. So interesting. go on. I, I, I agree. That's the way that we'd looked at it in the past. Yeah. And so what, what, what I kind of consider interesting now as this ESG movement is occurring is will we see a point in time where someone is brought to, to payday, so to speak, where they've made a bunch of strategic decisions that better align with ESG fundamentals, which has come at the cost, let's say. Let's say if, if some large shareholders can prove that them as a shareholder weren't given the priority, but rather the ESG fundamentals were given the priority. And so underperformance in one way or another has occurred, right? In this theoretical situation. What do you think would happen at that point? Is there any, has this happened yet? Um, I'm, it, it, was, it was a concept that sort of dawned on me and I thought, well, that, that would be a really interesting question, but I don't know if anyone can even answer it yet. It would be interesting how that would be judged because you have, again, you have to look at timing. So was that a short term savings? You, you know, your your I guess your your assumption is that in some ways ESG might cost more. And let's you know, you take environmental, taking better care, being a better steward of our environment, you know, yeah. that might cost more than just let it rip. Yeah. So yeah, I think that short term you could show that there's a cost difference, but what about the long term? How many companies that, that made that short-term decision of, oh, we're not going to care about people or we're not going to care about the environment. Mm. And then that comes back to bite them in a multi-billion dollar lawsuit down the road because they get caught polluting or they get caught treating their people in a way that turns out to be morally unacceptable or unethical. So, or, or treating their clients. And, and, you know, you've seen that with many banks where they're being put under a, a tremendous amount of scrutiny because of their governance. Yeah. So I think to do that properly, you would have to look at both short term and long term, and it would be an in depth study to prove one way or the other. Because I would argue it the other way that as you look at longer term, 
you're much more likely to mitigate and manage risk effectively by doing the right thing. Yes. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's a good answer. I, I would, uh, I mean, it's eventually going to happen, right? The, those, those two concepts are fundamentally opposing each other. And so one, it, one side, it needs to break. I'd imagine it'll, it'll, if I was to take a stab, I see the ESG movement as, uh, as eventually becoming like a part of the, if you want to call it the triple bottom line reporting, right. That, that becomes right. the, uh, the standard. And so it has to be taken into consideration rather than just the interest of the, of the shareholders. But as far as I'm aware that, 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 that collision while theoretical in nature, I can see eventually just because of the, you know, the large amount of uh, business dealings that go on in the world, eventually something like this will turn up in, in a court of law and, It'll be a very, very interesting outcome. So I would also argue that, that it's moving in the opposite direction of that in many ways. Um, last year, a, a group of CEOs met in an organization in the United States called the Business Roundtable. And this group decided that they wanted to redefine the goal of the firm. <laughs> so as you, as you stated, the goal of the firm back to Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics was maximize shareholder wealth. Yes, That was the definition of the firm's mission. The business roundtable expanded the definition of what the, the, the stakeholder is within a company. And one of the key things that they delineated is employees of the firm are a key stakeholder. So it is a requirement of the firm to look at the development and the well-being of the employees of the firm. If you take Friedman's definition, nowhere in there is that defined as well as the business roundtable has defined that. So that, you know, when you, when you think about, well, what's ESG all about? I think, you know, for the purists, the ESG is about driving change within the world. Yes. And when you look at companies like my, you know, maybe I'm biased here because my company, my parent company, S&P Global signed on to that business roundtable decision right. to broaden the definition of the purpose of the firm. So when you think about that, it's driving change. Yes. ESG is driving change in the way that companies think about their mission and the way that they operate. So when people invest in those ways, you know, I think a lot of people think I have to be in an impact investment in order to make a difference. Yeah, I know what you mean. But I would argue that that's not the case. By focusing more on ESG, whether it's core or whether it's a leader's type approach, you are encouraging, and I, I use encouraging like with a capital E, you are encouraging firms to change the way that they operate. So many firms now, when you look at how they report ESG, that's now come under the CFO as a function. It used to be this separate job huh. that, that might be linked to something like diversity and inclusion. You know, you would have this person and their job would be to gather the information and answer all these different reports that come in, you know, how are you doing on ESG? Yes. In many of the larger firms, that's been taken up by the CFO and it's become critically important. Wow. Our firm, uh, again, S using my firm as an example, S&P Global, this is the second year that we have filed a separate ESG report. So for, for two or three years now, you can see companies in the United States filing that as if it's, you know, your, your annual report. They're doing a separate ESG report just to provide more depth than what standard accounting procedures would ask for a company to report. <laughs> so it's driving more transparency. It's driving more proactive revealing of how are you doing in gender hiring and race? How are you doing in, in terms of, you know, the, the, your, your board, the way that it consists and how they're compensated? What are you doing in terms of the environment in, in terms of energy use and, and waste? You know, more of that's being reported now. So this, these are the changes that ESG investing are driving. Wow. Yeah, right. It's, um, it's actually probably more advanced than, than I had thought because the, the question that I'm, I'm kind of uh, looking at here on the screen is what difference do you think that sustainability or ethical investment makes? And I guess while it's not a requirement yet, if, if there's, if the, you know, some of the biggest companies in the world are leading the charge in volunteering this information, then I guess then the concept is, or well, the strategy is, I guess at that stage it is, uh, well, it's going to quickly become 
mandatory. And so what, what the, the, the capital E encouraging uh, companies to make better ESG decisions by investing in them or not investing in them. Uh, and then in order to, to make, uh, I guess you would say, a proper decision, it would require not only financial literacy of reading the uh, financial statements, but also the ability to, to digest a company's ESG report, I guess you would call it. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing regulators across the globe establish standards for ESG reporting. And I think that those standards will vary from region to region. You know, what Europe and what UK require will be different than what Canada requires. But I think you're going to see some commonality in terms of how they look at those risks within ESG and those opportunities within ESG. Um, Aligning them to the, the UN SDGs, the Sustainability Development Goals, Again, that's, that's going to be important. You're, you're seeing it now, but the way that that's done regionally will vary from place to place. And I think that's fine. You know, I think it, it could reflect regional and cultural differences about the way that people think about ESG and how it matters. Wow. There you go. Like, uh, I was not privy to that kind of information. Um, it, my conversations have typically been very uh, front line, how, how to have a conversation with your client as a financial planner. But it's, uh, it's been super interesting to learn about what the larger trends are and what's happening on from the big end of town and, and pushing down into the companies to make these decisions. Do you, do you see a bit of a time frame in terms of this no longer being um, a topic of conversation, but just as a normal business as usual event. Do you have a prediction in terms of how long that's going to take? Uh, I'm not going to put a date on it, um, <laughs> but, but we're well underway. Um, Price Waterhouse Cooper had a report that was put out uh, earlier today that, that focuses on ESG globally. Looking at Europe, for example, there's over f- almost 5,000 ESG mutual funds that exist across Europe. Whoa. And 70% of the global ESG assets are being tracked across Europe right now. So it's well underway in Europe. I think that Canada is another leader. Um, there's evidence that the U.S. is actually lagging compared to, you know, I was, I was looking over the ASX report on ETPs. And to me, um, you know, compared to the size of your ETP market in Australia, the, the rise of, of ESG Uh, ETPs in Australia looks healthy. I mean, you have six different issuers who are offering different ESG indices or even an active solution. And you have at least one fixed interest based ESG solution. So, you know, I think you're seeing it in Australia too. You know, the choices are there Uh, from the standpoint of wealth management and advisors. I think they need to be more curious about what their clients believe in and what they value and have those conversations and see how that can drive your business because the products are there. You know, you can do it as a global allocation. Now, what I would share is our research indicates you don't have to give up returns in order to get ESG as an exposure. We've shown with the S and P ASX 200, there's a slight tracking error. It's, it's about 2%. It's underperformed in the last year with the S and P 500 ESG. It's actually outperformed. So we would expect low tracking error. It should be very close to the the core benchmark. So you can be experiencing those ESG benefits, those key performance indicators with no real degradation to your performance within the portfolio. So you're making a difference. You're not having to pay explicitly for that. That's what the evidence suggests within ESG. Awesome. Mate, uh, thank you so much for putting aside this time to come on uh, and walk me through. In a lot of ways, educate me on, on how exactly large this, um, this movement is. It's well beyond the concept of how to, have, how to bring it up with a client. It, it, it looks to be a next set of standards and benchmarks to be measuring companies from in the future. So uh, thanks so much for coming on and sharing all that with us. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. Education is what we're all about at S&P Dow Jones. So thanks for allowing me to, to share some of that. And hopefully we've done something together to inspire advisors within Australia. Awesome, man. Thanks again. Take care.